Hello everyone, good morning, good afternoon. Professor Pei is an experienced board certified medical oncologist. He was a professor and the head of university department of medical oncology at the University Hospital uh, of Bern and in Sinspital from 94 to 2017. And since then, he continues to work as a senior consultant in medical oncology at the same institution. Uh, Professor Fay received his medical training in his, his postgraduate training at several Swiss hospitals and at the John Radcliffe Hospital in Oxford in the UK. During his position as head of medical oncology at the University of Bern, he spent a sabbatical at Harvard Institute of Medicine and at Dana Farber Cancer Institute in Boston. Professor Fay regularly reviews clinical trial proposals on behalf of German Ministry of Health and he served as chairman of the Scientific Committee of Cancer Research in Switzerland for more than 10 years. Professor Fay was responsible for the scientific program of many oncology meetings, including European Society of Medical Oncology. On behalf of European School of Oncology, he organized international lymphoma teaching courses, joined to the International Conference of Malignant Lymphoma for 20 years. Professor Fay has published more than 250 scientific articles in peer-reviewed journal. Now we will listen to the Professor Fay presentation. Well then, I would like to say hello to everyone around the globe who is listening um, in. It's late afternoon here in Switzerland and the day is really miserable, ending a long period of beautiful weather. And I hope that the weather at your end is more cheerful than here. But I'll be trying to cheer you up with this talk, which is really a survey, so to speak, about um, oncology and uh, how the field developed, specifically medical oncology, which is my field, as uh, Natasha Mühlemann, who invited me to give this talk, uh, so uh, kindly described. And I think when we look at cancer trials, at the development of um, cancer treatment, particularly with drug over a number of century, uh, over a number of decades, we should actually look at it first of all with a patient's eyes. And I think this first slide which I've prepared is quite important to my mind and its message is sometimes unfortunately not always considered. These are treatment goals which the patients would actually uh, tell us about when you talk to them what they would expect from a new treatment or from a treatment they are about to receive. They would like to live longer and I think this can be described as adding years to their life and the appropriate endpoint to measure that is uh, overall survival. Or they would like to live better and I would like to describe this as adding life to their years and this is in um, compassed and encapsulated by many, many quality of life assessments. And I think these are the two cornerstones in medical, medical uh, trials, cancer trials, where the value of new drugs or new drug combinations should be tested. And we'll be looking into that, whether this actually is practiced in this way or not. But let us dig back in the history and see what type of cancer drugs we actually have. And actually throughout the, uh, the uh, talk, we'll address perhaps the needs of some of you in the audience who are not medical oncologists and might appreciate a little historic um, background information. Well, the classic among cancer drugs are, of course, the cytostatics or chemotherapy, which was the first group of cancer drugs introduced several decades ago. And unfortunately, which is the group of drugs which have given medical oncology sometimes a sort of bad reputation because of the side effects they cause. Along came quite early on hormones, for example, tamoxifen to treat breast cancer, and then monoclonal antibodies were developed when recombinant DNA technology made that possible. And among the more recent ones, I would like to include nanobodies, which in principle are, of course, derived from the concept of monoclonal antibodies. And also for the last sort of 20 years or so, small inhibitor molecules, NIBs, have been developed, mostly tyrosine kinase inhibitors interfering in molecular pathways, which are important for the life and survival of a cancer cell. 
And finally, we are now witnessing a fascinating but also problematic area where we are digging into immune cellular therapy, particularly with CAR T cells. Now, all these drugs here are actually directed to work against cancer cells and killing them. And I'm afraid that's not the full story. And it was for a long time forgotten that cancer cells are embedded in a microenvironment in our body, in the body of the patient, in stroma, and mixed up with other cells derived from the patient's body, other normal cells, so to speak. So we now have monoclonal antibodies again, modulating immune response or angiogenesis, which is important for the survival, for the spreading of cancer cells or inhibition of these important pathways. We have recombinant proteins made possible through the uh, <clears throat> progress in molecular biology and cloning, which include growth factors and interleukins. And also we have small inhibitors, again, NIPs, for example, anti-angiogenic drugs, which are not expected to work directly onto the cancer cell, but modulate the environment so as to render it unfavorable for the spread of cancer uh, cells. But I would like to remind everyone that although this talk is being given in the year 2020, chemotherapy is not just an old hat which um, belongs to history and is no longer valid. If you look at the current curative systemic cancer treatment for advanced cancers, which are not amenable to curative surgery, then you will see that the backbone of the successful treatment le leading to true cancer cure is still chemotherapy, whether we like it or not. This is certainly true for aggressive lymphomas. Chemotherapy and monoclonal antibodies added against particular antigens, particularly CD20, that would be a drug called rituximab. Acute leukemia, particularly acute myeloid leukemia, is still being treated with very heavy chemotherapy. And on top of that, with allogeneic stem cell transplantation, which in itself also needs what we call conditioning chemotherapy. Same is true for advanced testicular cancer in young men, early breast cancer, adjuvant chemotherapy is by definition given when a breast cancer has been removed by the surgeons more or less radically, but often then minimal residual disease is left behind, which is not amenable to surgery. And that actually can be killed in an appreciable proportion of these women with adjuvant chemotherapy. If you take a subgroup of breast cancer women, and I'll come back on them, they are marked by an overexpressed oncogene termed HER or HER2. They are called as um, uh, termed as having HER2 positive breast cancer. There we do have a monoclonal antibody, trastuzumab or Herceptin, but on its own, it doesn't actually suffice to provide cure to these women. We still need chemotherapy. Same is true for early colorectal cancer. And also the uh, impressive successes in the treatment of it, many advanced and different types of pediatric cancers are all to this day due to chemotherapy. So chemotherapy is still very much there, although we're still obviously are digging into other fields in order to improve the uh, prognosis and the outlook of our cancer patients. And this here, the next slide, is just a very impressive um, example of the giant steps forward which chemotherapy allowed us to make in the treatment of a variety of cancers. Hodgkin's lymphoma is a lymph node cancer which was uncurable in the 50s. That's when I was born. So I often taught our medical students that in the year I was born in 1952, all patients died from Hodgkin's disease. Nowadays, or during the last few years when I still taught at our medical school, I was proud to explain to the students that nowadays almost no patient dies from Hodgkin's disease. And that, that actually <clears throat> started in the late 60s, precisely 1967, when a chemotherapy regime called MOP, 
was tested in a phase two trial. And you can actually see in this Kaplan-Meyer uh, um, curve here, depicting overall survival, that we have a plateau here at 50%, with 50% for the, of the patients cured. And do remember that before this chemotherapy was given, none of these patients were cured. Unfortunately, nowadays, we never see such giant leaps forward, but this was certainly a major advance and progress. And it came cheap. Uh, MOP actually costs, the cost of the drugs is 400 to 500 US dollars per cycle times six. And I don't think with that little money, you get very far uh, nowadays with the newer drugs. And that's a problem in its own right. A little later, or at about the same time, a physician called Charles Huggins made an important observation. He was from Chicago, um, Illinois, and he actually uh, received the Nobel Prize in 1966 for his uh, findings. He discovered that prostate and breast cancer may be hormone-dependent cancer, and hence he concluded that these tumors are hormone-responsive. And it is still true, so hormones, or anti-hormones, if you prefer the term, have become important to treat certain cancers. And this is a picture here of a breast cancer um, shown that looked at down the microscope with a test being done on it to uh, show up estrogen receptors. And all the red dots here are nuclei of the cancer cells. The cancer cells come here in solid groups of cells and each of the, uh, sorry, I have to go back to that. Uh, um, can I, uh, I need to go back, sorry about that. Yeah, uh, each of these cells contains a nucleus expressing to a very high degree estrogen receptor, which means that these cells are susceptible to hormone manipulation. If these red dots were not seen, then that breast cancer would be ER negative and would not respond. That was actually one of the first, if not the very first example of a cancer tested with a biomarker and that biomarker being found to be predictive of a response to treatment. On came molecular biology, the basis for personalized cancer drugs. And all you need to do in this context is just to look at the genes. Because in cancer cells, we often find somatic gene mutations or in families, afflicted with hereditary um, cancer load. We see germline gene mutations, which of course there are present in every type of um, cell in these particular individuals. And a seminal um, observation was published in Nature and in Science in the year 2001, when the full sequence of the human genome uh, became known, became public, and hence we have now techniques to look at the molecular composition and molecular alterations of cancer cells. And I think cancer biomarker assessment is now a very important tool. And I would like to draw your attention to the simple fact that we can either get a positive, negative, yes or no answer if we look at molecular diagnostics over here. If you do a molecular assessment, a mutation is present or it is not present. This is yin, yang, positive, negative, and relatively simple, just as much as the zebra here, which I photographed on a safari in Botswana, has black or white stripes, but not much in between. In immunohistochemistry, things are more difficult. You actually get very positive uh, samples, and I showed you one with this estrogen receptor positivity, and then you get very totally negative samples, but unfortunately, anything in between. So in every case where we do immunohistochemistry for a biomarker, we have to decide somewhere here a threshold or a cutoff where we deem a cancer cell to be negative on this side, or we think that it is um, positive, which would be on this side over here. And this is far from trivial and adds often to confusion in the literature, particularly when we try to run trials, uh, testing or using these biomarkers for targeted um, treatment. 
I give you an example now, a rel relatively early and time-honored one on breast cancer, expressing or overexpressing, as it were, her two um, protein. And if you look at this slide here, you can actually see that each of the cancer cells here have a very neat brown rim around it. This is the receptor, the HER2 receptor expressed on the surface of this particular cancer cell. The gene in the cell is amplified. There are far too many copies of that gene, not just two, as would be normal, but maybe 17, 18, 20 or even more, leading to overexpression of the protein. And that pattern is found in 25% of breast cancers, again, of course, with that ladder or that grading, which I showed in immunohistochemistry just on the previous slide, from raging for very faint to extremely strong. And we have an antibody targeting this surface protein here called trastuzumab, and it has been found to be helpful in treating breast cancer. And I would like to take you through a, one of the very first studies of targeted or personalized treatment, uh, which was published by Dennis Slayman Slame, in the New England Journal. They gave anti-HER2 monoclonal antibody monotherapy and received a response in a quarter of all cases, despite the fact that the protein was very heavily expressed. And the question is, why is this so lousy? Why don't all the women uh, or the cancers of these women who do express the target respond, but only 25% uh, actually do respond? You still, unfortunately, had and still have to combine this with chemotherapy in order to increase the response rates to about 50%. Chemotherapy is still necessary to this day, which is somewhat sobering if you think about uh, hopes of getting away from chemotherapy thanks to personalized cancer medicine. A longer median survival was uh, achieved in these women with metastatic breast cancer, which is not a curative situation of plus five months. Why not longer? And finally, it was shown that the antibody may elicit cardiotoxicity leading to heart failure in extreme cases. And that is certainly something which we never wanted to do. We never wanted to target the heart. But it's still called personalized uh, medicine, although it has some problems. And sometimes I'm a bit skeptical whether the term really lives up to the promise which uh, it would give us. I mentioned pathways, and I think this is a famous one, the EGFR pathway in normal cells and in cancer cells. It's the epidermal growth factor receptor pathway, and it's typical of many pathways which are overwrought or which work too much or are too active or otherwise deranged in cancers, which drives the cancer cells into their malignant behavior. So if I may take you through this pathway, we have a receptor here at the cell surface. This is the cell surface, and this is the nucleus here with a gene which is important for the normal behavior for, of the cancer cell and which is currently off. So if we add here the growth factor, epidermal growth factor, it will actually link up with the receptor. This will activate a kinase, which is an enzyme, which means that phosphates will actually be added to a series of proteins, GRAP, SOS, RAS, RAF, etc. a whole chain of events being triggered through this interaction at the cell surface, and eventually through MEC and MAP kinase, this a signal will be fired into the um, cell nucleus, and that gene here will be activated. Now, if that um, pathway goes crazy or bonkers through activation, undue activation of the kinase here, that might contribute to malignant behavior of this particular cell. And that's what we'd like to do something against. So what we can do is to block this uh, receptor up here, either through a monoclonal antibody outside the cell or through a tyrosine kinase inhibitor, a small molecule inside the cell. And this actually does the trick to some extent, unless this whole pathway here does not seem to bother any longer about what's happening up here. And this is the case if RAS gets mutated and becomes constitutionally active. 
which means that in this case, the pathway will actually be firing away from mutant RAS in its own right and activating this gene just to, in total disregard of whether we are trying to treat with monoclonal antibodies or tyrosine kinase inhibitors, and hence the cancer cell will become refractory to these particular drugs. We can nowadays, of course, do these molecular tests in our cancer cells, for example, in colon cancer, and we do do them, and we asked our pathologists to do them for us because we need this um, information. Another uh, important example of personalized or molecular diagnosis driven therapy choice is non-small cell lung cancer. When I was a student, we were taught that lung cell as non-small cell lung cancer can be split into squamous cell cancer and adenocarcinoma, and that was it. Molecular biology has actually taught us that lung cancer is driven by taxi driver mutations. And some of you who like the cinema might actually um, recognize Robert De Niro in this particular, uh, in this particular uh, picture here. And a number of these are called ALK, BRAF, EGFR, which I've already explained, Kiras, etc. And we have tyrosine kinase inhibitors blocking one or the other of them in a specific way. And this has greatly ameliorated and improved the prognosis of patients with inoperable non-small cell lung cancer, although none of these modern treatments are jury, curative and patients will eventually die from their cancer. So we've, I've talked now about drugs targeting the cancer as such, and this is a full list of NIPs for diverse leukemias, non-small cell lung cancer, or antibodies, against lymphoma, breast cancer, or colon cancer. But I think we should, as I showed in one of the very first slides, um, remember the environment and the immune system. And this is actually an interesting paper. It's actually a very old one. It was published in 1893 by Dr. Coley from New York, who injected patients with extracts from inflammatory le uh, lesions for erysipela. Erysipela, for those of you who are not familiar with the term, is actually a bacterial inflammation of the skin, which can look very nasty. And Coley actually extracted did the fluid from that and injected it into cancer patients who had sarcoma, which is a soft tissue cancer. And he actually observed um, responses much to his surprise. Unfortunately, this was long forgotten. He must have influenced in one way or another the microenvironment and the immune response to these cancers. And when I was a young trainee, I was given this slide by a pathologist. And I still like it because you can actually see here, these are the tubules of an adenocarcinoma of the colon. And the brown dots in between here are T cells marked by an anti T cell antibody. And I always felt for many, many years, and it was for a long time, a non believer in uh, being able to manipulate the immune system to treat uh, cancer. Eventually, I was proven wrong, as I'll show you in a minute. I looked at these cells and found that there are so many cells of the immune system, and yet the cancer cells here are just doing fine. They don't seem to be bothered at all by these cancer cells, uh, by these T cells, sorry. We now know why. Because this is a tumor cell over here, the cancer cell. This is the T cell from the immune system. And the T cell can actually recognize the cancer cell as something strange or foreign. But that would actually trigger a response from the T cell, which would lead to the death of the cancer cell. But the cancer cell, in turn, can defend itself by expressing programmed death ligand 1, which interacts with with a program death receptor one on the T cell. And that whole linkage here blocks the activity of the T cell. So it remains inert and just sits there and watches. And what we now have in our therapeutic armamentarium are monoclonal antibodies like this one here, which block the block, if you like. 
And if that happens, then the T cell can actually go about attack the tumor cell and remove it. And this is exactly what happens when nowadays we give immune checkpoint um, inhibitors. And I'll give you an example. This is from a uh, trial published in the New England Journal a couple of years ago, non-small cell lung cancer, comparing docetax cell, which is a chemotherapy, with nivolumab, which is one of these immune checkpoint inhibitors. And as you can see, the blue line, the nivolumab line, looks much better in this overall survival Kaplan-Meier curve than does the docetax L arm. And I, particularly the statisticians among you will, of course, appreciate that the hazard ratio for death here is actually a pretty neat result in favor of the new drug. So this seems to be some progress. And just let us look into this progress with a critical eye. We would like to get predictive biomarkers for these immune checkpoint inhibitors, but this is not at all satisfactory. When we look at PD-1, which is this protein expressed, and PD-1 uh, uh, ligand 1, which is also a protein expressed in this interaction between cancer cell and T cell, we get all this famous arrange, which I talked uh, about already, in immunohistochemistry between strongly positive and virtually negative. And the correlation between this result, immunohistochemistry looked at down the microscope, and the therapeutic result when you actually give the drug to the patient is far from satisfactory. There's no really tight or close link, although we would like to have that. Boosting anti-tumor T cell responses, which we can achieve with this drug, is unfortunately not limited to the cancer cells. And still, some of us call that targeted or precision cancer medicine, which sometimes sounds a bit strange to my critical life. I. And the corollary of that is that we see new side effects. They are different from chemotherapy side effects. They are autoimmune phenomena in that the T cell system of the body is actually stimulated and aroused to attack perfectly normal healthy tissues or organs. And this can lead to lung toxicity, very considerable um, colon toxicity with intractable diarrhea and a fair number of other disorders. And it almost opens up a textbook of uh, internal medicine. And I think medical oncologists need to be aware of all these new side effects and treat them appropriately. Drug resistance of the cancer, just as much as in chemotherapy, still remains an unsolved uh, problem. And now we finally come to the last chapter of uh, the latest chapter of cellular immunotherapy using CAR T cells. This is a cell therapy. And it actually goes back in a way, if you like, to the pioneering work of Henry Ford over in the United States, who ages ago decided that everyone should have a car. So he built a Ford Model T and he sold it as a car for everyone for $650. That, to my mind, was probably the model on which CAR T cells um, were um, built, with the notable exception that nowadays, you don't actually get this drug for $650. You have to add a few zeros, unfortunately, which, of course, to my mind, is a considerable problem. These cancer therapies are becoming so expensive that even for well-to-do societies, or um, rich countries like the US or Switzerland, this is a considerable burden on the healthcare system. Now, how do CAR T cells work and are they able to overcome good old chemotherapy? We have patients with particular leukemias and particular lymphomas, and they have T cells, obviously, which are normal. They are not part of the leukemic clone, and these are collected by leukophoresis after the patient has been treat, treated with chemotherapy. Here we go again. Then these cells are manipulated in vitro here and transduced with an expression vector containing a gene encoding the chimeric antigen receptor construct. That's what the abbreviation stands for. And then these CAR T cells are grown in culture to uh, produce appreciable and useful numbers of them. Eventually, in between, the patient receives conditioning chemotherapy. And I still think that this is a bit sobering. We just don't get away from chemotherapy. And after that, 
the patient receives an infusion of CAR T cells, which then would attack residual leukemic cells and or lymphoma cells and eventually um, get a decent and interesting therapeutic response. And I just show two early trials, results of two trials published um, a little while ago in the New England Journal. Diffuse large B cell lymphoma, heavily pretreated patients, overall survival. You seem to be getting a median survival of about 50%, which for heavily pretreated patients with this pathology is quite good. Or follicular lymphoma, overall su survival looks brilliant in pretreated patients, um, uh, hovering around 90% or so. There's two problems with these, certainly extremely interesting or to put it simply, good result. First of all, you can actually see down here that the number of patients treating are really very small. I don't think the statisticians listening in are duly impressed when you come up with a trial with just 14 patients. And I would also like to uh, point out that the overall result is much worse in B-cell lymphoma, which is an aggressive cancer, than in follicular lymphoma. And what this actually shows is the natural history of a cancer, its biology. Follicular lymphoma is a chronic um, indolent lymphoma, whereas diffuse large B cell lymphoma is an aggressive cancer, which if not treated suitably will soon kill the patient. And it is interesting that although we have made some progress with CAR T cells, they are obviously not yet able to overrule the natural history uh, of a cancer and biology of the cancer cell as such still dictates outcome in these instances to a considerable degree. So let's come to an interim summary. Problems of progress. Frequent cancers are split by biomarkers into many rare molecular entities. Uh, this is uh, also described as cancer heterogeneity. So we are faced with the problem that if we would like to study these cancers and develop new treatments, we are study many rare diseases instead of one frequent disease. We are studying many, many different types of lung cancer split by through molecular diagnostics and not just lung cancer, which obviously would be a frequent disease as such. Within one patient, and I think this is very important and often overlooked, the biology of cancer lesions may differ. This is called in-cancer heterogeneity. And the problem, very practically speaking, is that if you have a biopsy, say, obtained through bronchoscopy from a patient with lung cancer, you will have a small piece of tissue for molecular diagnostics, and yet that patient might have other lesions in the liver, elsewhere in the lung, in the bone, which might have a different molecular composition. And it's completely out of question even to be thinking about biopsying all of that. And that heterogeneity will mean that not all lesions seen in a patient on CT scanning or on a PET scan will respond equally well if you select a specific drug simply based on the molecular analysis of one specific piece of tissue. New drugs come up by the dozens. I think some of them are new two drugs and it is really a matter of critical thinking and critical analysis of preliminary results to make sure that we are only studying the really promising ones. How precise and targeted are the drugs? I'm afraid they're less precise and less targeted than we are often given to think. The current treatment standards now over time since medical oncology as a relatively young baby in medicine was uh, born and invented, are really very good. I talked about Hodgkin's disease. If you jump from 50% uh, cure rates to 95% cure rates, just to get the last 5% done is really quite tough. And the same is true for other areas. And I already mentioned that the prices for the new cancer drugs are exploding and exorbitantly high, even for well-to-do country. And to my mind, this is a great concern and a great problem when we practice uh, cancer medicine. And this actually brings me to the next slide. How should we um, 
test all these new drugs? And how do we run targeted trials when we are talking about targeted drugs? And I'd just like to remind you of what the patient expect from us. These are the endpoints and the expectation of patients. Yet what we often see that in many trials, typical endpoints are used which have very little to do with what the patients expect from us. In phase two clinical trials, typical endpoints are progression-free survival, failure-free survival, or response defined by RESIS criteria, quality of life, and of course, pharmacology, including pharmacodynamics and pharmacokinetics. And uh, I personally, would like to seize the opportunity to uh, ask you to join me in fighting progression-free survival as an endpoint, particularly in phase three trials, because I personally believe uh, that it is not really an appropriate endpoint. And I give you a patient example. This is a patient whom I treated uh, about 10 years ago with metastatic um, hormone receptor negative breast cancer. And you can actually see here, she had lung metastasis. This here is a lung metastasis. And she received a combination chemotherapy of two drugs, which had been tested in this setting in phase three trials and found to yield a positive result. And you can actually see here that virtually nothing is left of this lung metastasis a couple of months later. Her progression-free survival, so the time measured until this lesion here would eventually progress again was 11 months when based on the literature, I was expecting only four to six months. So in terms of progression to survival, what I did to her certainly would score as an evidence-based individual success. However, however, in yellow, you see the side effects of chemotherapy, which this poor woman had to suffer. She spent several um, periods in hospital because of fever and neutropenia caused by the drugs. She had a severe hand foot syndrome, which is an inflammatory condition of the um, soles of the feet and the hand. Uh, she was unable to walk and leave her house for weeks on end. She had severe mucositis. She was often in hospital. So in the end, her PFS result boils down to just five from these 11 months of good quality of life. And looking back on that, although I treated her on an evidence-based phrase uh, three level, I'm not quite sure I treated her all that well. And what we ought to remember is a very old uh, uh, saying that is often forgotten that the tumor ideally in oncology should shrink faster than the patient. I'm not sure, uh, quite sure this was the case here. So here are some arguments and I would welcome a discussion and your question about this against PFS remission rates and remission duration as primary endpoints in phase three trials used for clinical practice later on. I'm not talking about early phase one, two trials where we would simply would like to see whether a drug works or not. In that setting, these endpoints are uh, of course correct. But in later phases, when it comes to testing drugs or drug combinations for clinical routine use, I'm not sure that PFS is good enough. And the reason is the response of a tumor lesion seen on the CT scan as shown with the example of this lady is not a sufficient goal or a treatment success as such. Tumor response and PVS do not guarantee longer and better life. It would have to be shown for each disease that they are indeed valid surrogate markers, often they are not. And PFS clearly was initially by its fathers or mothers not invented for phase um, three. And the fact which I sometimes hear or the argument that we've always done it in this way, that's not a very scientific argument. I don't think it's going to get us anywhere. Or the argument that the FDA wants it is to my mind really neither here nor there. And I'm looking forward to receiving your comments on this explicitly somewhat uh, provocative um, statements. Do we get definitive phase two clinical cancer trials which are truly apt at um, establishing new treatment standards which will stand the test of time? Yes, when the results of a phase two trial are absolutely smashing, 
I would like to remind you of the results of MOP chemotherapy for Hodgkin disease. If in one trial with one chemotherapy regime, you bring up the cure rate from zero to 50%, I don't think you need many phase three trials to uh, prove that this is a major advance for this patient. But as I told you earlier in this talk, this is something which we don't observe so frequently any longer. Now, when the disease is rare, and I explained that many cancer diseases are getting rare because we split them through molecular diagnostics, randomized phase three trials may perhaps not be feasible because there just aren't enough patients around. Uh, in international multi-center trials, even for relatively rare cancers, we can now actually connect many countries, many continents, and run such trials even in rare disease, and this is what we should do if it is um, feasible. Often phase two clinical cancer trials today do not meet these uh, two important criteria above. So let us look at a number of clinical phase three trial types, which the statisticians among you will certainly know, but I would like to comment on them from a clinical point of view. In a phase three trial, randomized, we can look for superiority, and that's what we've done over many decades. New is better. It has become more fashionable to look for non-inferiority, which implies that new may be better, but at least not worse. And I'd like to just point out one example of a non-inferiority trial, which um, is, of course, uh, encapsulating this type of trial, this result, this result defined by the uh, uh, <clears throat> confidence interval falling into this range here, which is defined as the non-inferiority margin, which as an arbitrary decision needs to be agreed upon before the trial starts. And this is such a non-inferiority phase three trial in aggressive B-cell non skin lymphoma. The chemotherapy is chopped, an antibody is added rituximab. Standard is six cycles, and these authors tested whether we could get away with four cycles of chemotherapy. You can see the overall survival curve here. They look exactly alike. I think this is non-inferiority. Four cycles does not need to be better. At least it shouldn't be worse. So this is a good example. And I think in every non-inferiority trial, there must be an obvious advantage for the new treatment, which as such does not require testing through randomization. In this case here, it's uh, bloody obvious that receiving four cycles of our chop chemotherapy, which is a very unpleasant chemotherapy, is actually much easier for the patient and less cumbersome and less toxic than having to undergo uh, six cycles of the same treatment. But that advantage should really be very obvious, and it is not always the case. Patient selection in trials is a problem. We run trials, we carefully select the patients, but maybe we are doing too much of a good thing here. And uh, a, a, a little over 15 or 16 years ago, we ran uh, an analysis here at the uh, university hospital where I work, where we looked at the uh, patients with acute myeloblastic leukemia for a defined long period of time, a time during which we always had at least one or several phase three trials open for these patients. So we always had a trial ready for these patients unless they um, refused to participate or if they didn't um, in, uh, comply with the exclusion, uh, with the inclusion criteria. And the question was then, we also had the opportunity, I should add that, to identify all the patients from our referral area because at least for the diagnosis of AML, which is still tricky, they were referred to us even if they didn't end up in the trial. So what you can actually see here is that we have here um, a little less than half of the percent uh, of the total number of patients included in the trials. You get an overall survival, 10-year overall survival, which is somewhere around 30%. The patients who never made it into your trial are down here, overall survival after 120 months, um, around um, 5 to 10%. So this seems to teach us that it's always a good idea to join a trial. You seem to be better, doing better with that. On the other hand, the prognostic factors of these patients here are much worse 
than the ones who were eventually treated in a trial. The non-trial patients down here were older, they had severe comorbidity and all that, but yet they do have AML. And when we co quote treatment results of AML nowadays, we tend to quote this result and seem to be forgetting about these, particularly when we would like to look at the whole population of AML patients. So there is a bias towards including patients with a relatively better prognosis uh, by their biology in clinical trials and forget about the others, which of course does not quite um, uh, reflect what's happening in practice. In randomized trials, we need to select the standard arm. This is far from trivial. I just show the practice guidelines for the treatment of follicular lymphoma. It seems to be a wild choice array of choice of treatment. No one agrees which the best regime would be to treat these lymphomas. So you probably would have to select one or the other if you treat, uh, would like to test a new treatment against the standard. And if you actually select an anthracycline free uh, regime, then you will be criticized by those who think you should absolutely give job. If you give job, then someone else will come and say, you should give them a purine analog and all the rest of that. So it's not so terribly easy. The other question is in oncology, are we allowed and when are we allowed to use placebo as a comparator arm? This is a trial here where a um, tyrosine kinase inhibitor, a NIP, Pasopenib was uh, used as first-line therapy in advanced metastatic renal cell cancer. And by PFS, which I would like to remind you I dislike, you can actually see a huge advantage for the new drug with respect to placebo. However, during the time this trial was run, first-line therapy in these patients was not really nothing. There were drugs established interferons, chemotherapies, etc. And the argument of the authors of this paper was that they ran this particular part of the trial in Eastern Europe where all these drugs were too expensive and not available to the patients. So they felt it was okay to use the new drug and comparing with placebo because these patients would not get access to the then standard drugs anyway. I think this is ethically highly questionable and I'm still uh, wondering why the Journal of Clinical Oncology, which is of course a very well respected journal, did not even bother to write a, an um, editorial about this to my mind unethical practice. Uh, I think the baseline of this is new treatments must be tested against the best current standard. The Stampede trial in prostate cancer is actually the um, example of a so-called adaptive trial design. And I think we are improving ways to run uh, new trials in a rapidly changing world. And I think this is a wonderful trial design which allows for changement of treatments within a um, master protocol, if you like. Prostate cancer, metastatic prostate cancer, it started here uh, more than 10 years ago. Standard of care was antigen, um, androgen deprivation. Now, thanks to the results of this trial, you can actually see this arm here. Docetusk cell in those days was added as a experimental chemotherapy. It proved to be successful. So it was moved up here into the standard arm, which is maintained. And in the meantime, new drugs, which perhaps will make it or perhaps won't be able to make it, are being added. Whereas these other arms here are uh, closed. Some of them has made it into the, the a new standard, some of them haven't. I think this is a very interesting example of a good trial for adaptive um, uh, trial design. Umbrella clinical trial uh, trials, um, they take one cancer, lung cancer, split it, stratify it through molecular diagnostics, and then give chemotherapy according to the biomarkers found. And this is an example of focus for an umbrella type uh, trial on colon cancer therapy. And you can actually see here that various mutations were identified in these cancers. And for example, here, cancers with no mutation, these are wild type tumors, then would receive either placebo or uh, a HER2 uh, or HER1 inhibitor. And in this particular subgroup of patients, no benefit was found for this particular new drug.
I think this example here shows the strengths we can pull out specific groups from a larger trial and treat them with drugs which we think might be appropriate for that sub group but by the same token there's also a problem as you can see again we have very small patient numbers we have 16 placebo versus 16 treated with the new drugs and I'm sure the statisticians listening in will agree that the power of such a trial is probably not very good Pasket clinical uh, cancer trials many cancer types are put in one basket because they share one target or biomarker and they get the treatment according to the target irregarding, uh, regardless of their histology. And this is an example here. This is a fusion gene which is found as an abnormal biomarker in many solid tumors. It can be blocked through this kinase inhibitor and trectinib, and you can actually see in this waterfall that many cancers will respond to these new drugs, including cholangiocarcinoma, colorectal, breast gynecological sarcoma, uh, non-small cell lung cancer, and even neuroendocrine tumors, which are histologically and biology very distinct, but have one common theme, which is the NTRAC fusion. Um, gene. So this brings me to the final um, summary of my thoughts. The new cancer treatments are perhaps less targeted and a bit less personalized than is often pretended. They're still very interesting and worth our while. I believe that trial design should be refined just as much as our understanding of the biology of the cancer cell and its environment. I would like to interline that are improving. Cancer patients which wish to live longer, better, or both. And trial design, particularly the selection of primary endpoints, to my mind, should reflect this directly. And we should be incorporating patient-reported outcome much more than what we've done so far. And I would like to remind everyone the prices of new cancer drugs are exorbitant. Um, and I think only if we accept these prices, which is one political question, if we have to accept it, then only the very best one drugs should be allowed on the market and not the ones which improve PFS by two or three months. I would like to thank you for your attention. I also recognize that many of us, all of us, live in exasperating difficult times. So please stay healthy and I hope you will overcome all of us this COVID crisis um, in a fit way in order to be looking after our cancer patients and helping to improve their outlook for the next 10 or 20 years. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to your questions. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Fay. I'd like to ask you the first question, coming back to the quality of life. Um, looking at the patient reported quality of life or clinician reported quality of life, um, when you define the quality of life at an endpoint, what would be the acceptable threshold? Well, actually, that you see, you cannot measure quality of life as such. You need to measure it tailored to the specific disease. Say, for example, if you've got a patient with lung cancer who might have difficulty uh, in, in breathing and might have uh, intractable cough and all that, then you must use another quality of life scale to address the needs of that particular patient than if you have a man with prostate cancer and pain due to um, skeletal uh, metastases. So I think this is just, uh, you actually must select the quality of life reporting tools according to the needs uh, of the patient. Then I'm convinced that we absolutely must let the patient report on their quality of life in a way which is not influenced by the expectations of the clinicians. And even if clinicians mean well, if they ask the patient, now you're doing very well with these new drugs, aren't you? I'm sure you're excellent and I think your cough has diminished since I last saw you. The most patients will not dare to contradict the good doctor, but we'll see, yes, of course, absolutely that is the case. And then uh, that patient will be scored as a success in terms of a doctor reported quality of life improvement. This is not the way to do it. I think the patient should be given their forms and every um, care should be taken that as many forms are returned as possible. In fact, 
if you look at quality uh, of life data in many randomized trial, there's always a relatively great proportion of the missing. And it is quite rare that uh, almost all patients actually do send in their field forms over time, maybe at the beginning, but it stands, uh, uh, it, uh, they, they, uh, the, the compliance of the discipline uh, is uh, deteriorating over time and the clinicians must really be aware of that and dig into that. It's not just something which needs to be done because you will publish these data in an appendix of the, of the paper. This is often the practice nowadays. It's really, to my mind, a central issue and often overlooked still to this day. Okay, thank you. We have another question from the colleagues. Um, could you comment on the local versus central blinded independent review of scans for response or progression assessment? Well, I think uh, there must be a blinded uh, review. I actually quite like the idea of uh, radiologists being blind when they look at pictures. This is sort of uh, sounds like an uh, ironic statement. Of course, what we mean is that radiologists actually get the, uh, the results and they don't know the treatment allocation <clears throat> and just look at them in a possibly unbiased way. I think this should, should really be done as in, a, in an as clean as fashion as possible. There was actually ages ago a very interesting paper on uh, measuring by a radiologist of lung cancer metastases. And these radiologists were given CT scans from a number of patients with lung metastases and the CT scans had been taken at um, zero minutes and 15 minutes later a repeat scan was done. And then these scans were actually sent out as diagnostic scans and follow-up scans to radiologists who were not aware that the time lapse between the two um, investigations was only 15 minutes where, where nothing really can happen. And I can assure you it's fun to read that paper because there's so many responses, progressions and this and that being reported in people who really take their, um, uh, their task seriously. So this can only um, be the uncertainty or the the imprecision of radiology can, to my mind, only be overcome through very uh, diligent, blinded central review. Thank you. Um, our time and our webinar is actually coming uh, to closure. And on behalf of Satel again, thank you, thank you for joining us today and have the great rest of your day.